Well, good, good morning, everyone. This is Rick Gaysford. I serve as the chair of the UEN Advisory Council, and I welcome you to this uh, August 2020 uh, UEN Advisory Council meeting. I have my screen set to grid view. I feel like I'm playing Hollywood Squares. See Ray Timothy up there in the corner where I go. He's got the top corner there almost. Okay. <laughs> that so uh, I can remember how the game was played. That'd be even better. But there we go. We got uh, got a few cameras coming on, so we look like we're uh, playing the game here. Um, hopefully, you have all had a uh, good summer. I'm sure that uh, it's been more. It's been different. Um, as it has, you know, just because of the situation that we currently live in and uh, glad that you're all able to be with us. And I hope that uh, you haven't been too busy with work. I know that this has probably been one of the more interesting uh, summers uh, that we have, uh, that I have been through uh, between schools. Uh, certainly uh, all of the things that I used to do during the summer, you know, summer Workshops, conferences, uh, none of those took place this year, but those were filled in with some other things. We have a pretty full agenda today, uh, particularly in regards to, I think, one of the items where uh, they'll be going over in some detail some of the things that have occurred. Um, when we met in June, a lot of these things that we'll be talking about today were not even on the radar. And uh, they have to be concluded before, much of this has to be concluded even before the end of the year. So um, your input today will be of value. And, uh, and and certainly we, if you have questions, we would hope that you'll be able to get those uh, answered in that. Um, would like to begin just briefly by just doing an open mic. Anybody who would like to just, um, well, maybe we'll go through and, uh, yeah, we will. I would like to go through and just uh, make sure your camera is on if you're in a position that you've got a camera. But I would just like quickly to uh, uh, to do introductions. Um, just and that will also help staff to be able to identify um, everyone here as well if they happen to be missing, uh, as the screens are constantly changing just a little bit. Um, I think I've already introduced myself. Shelly, I'm going to have you introduce yourself, and then we'll, uh, I would like the UEN, uh, UEN staff to introduce themselves, and then finally the advisory council members that are here. I'm Shelly Balflower from Weber State University. I'm the co-chair of this committee along with Rick. Ray, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you, Rick. I'm Ray Timothy. I'm the CEO, Executive Director of UETN. And then all of the UEN folks that are here with us. I'm Laura Hunter. I'm the COO of UEN. Nice to see everybody. I'm Mike Shuping, and I'm the Associate Director of Administration for UEN. Lisa Keen, I'm the CFO for UETN. I'm Kelly Cole, and I'm over strategic initiatives for UEN. I'm Rich Finlinson, Associate Director of Communication, UETN. I'm Katie Garrett. I manage our digital media services at UEN. Hello, I'm Susan Cullen, Public Relations Specialist with UETN. Good morning. I'm Barry Bryson, Associate Director of Network Planning and uh, Technical Advocacy. The others from UEN are, are going to introduce themselves. And let's uh, have the Advisory Council members, if you would go ahead now and introduce yourself. And Scott, we'll start with you. I'm Scott McCombs, uh, Director of IT for Kenyon School District. I represent uh, IT directors. Uh, 
Tony Pellegrini, uh, uh, Department Chair for Teacher Education down here at SUU and represent teacher education. Uh, Jason Strait, I'm the Director at Central Utah Education Services, one of the four regional education service agencies in the state. Clint Stevens, uh, Southwest Educational Development Center. I represent the uh, C Forum, the statewide uh, technology trainers. I apologize for being in the recliner. My home office had to be uh, put back into a bedroom for a little while. So good to see everybody. I'm Kim Zebarth, and I'm an Associate Commissioner for Technical Education for UCHI. I'm Julie I Hartley. I'm the Associate Commissioner of Academic Education for UCHI. I'm R.C. Callahan. I'm from Weber State University. I represent distance ed and Canvas administration, uh, administrators. And I'm camping right now, I'm trying to <laughs> stay away. Stay away from the COVID. Uh, rub it in. <laughs> that we're all. Um, I'm Brad Welch with Centricom. I represent Rural Telephone. Greg Shear from Davis Technical College representing uh, the technical colleges. Marie Erickson, uh, Resources Program Manager from the State Library. Tim Benson, CTE Teachers. I'm in Iron County School District. I'm Leslie Baker from UVU, and I'm representing the Academic Library Consortium. Any others that haven't had an opportunity? So just to bring up an, an open mic, just for a little bit of fun, does anybody have anything of uh, interest, a fun announcement, good announcement, good news that they would like to uh, to share with the, the group? Rick, it's Laura. There's two people that weren't able to introduce themselves. They may be having audio issues. So, uh, Diana Simmons is with BYU Broadcasting, representing public media, and Kyle Anderson is part of our staff. He's the program manager for KUEN. Okay, thank, thank you. I had three grandchildren here in Cedar ah, this year, and I just am not brave to hold all three at the same time. <laughs> Congratulations. That's great. A new little grandchild born as well you know, a few weeks ago. So, well, hearing that nobody else wants to jump in, we'll jump into the agenda. Our first item is the approval of the minutes from the June meeting. Uh, hopefully, you've had an opportunity to review those, and I would uh, accept a motion to approve those minutes. This is Kim, so moved. Thank you. Do I have a second to the approval of the minutes? This is Shelly, I'll, I'll uh, second that motion. Thank you, Shelly. All in favor then of, uh, of approving the minutes from the June meeting, uh, you would just please say aye or thumbs up on the screen. Either, either way will work. Aye. Aye. I think that that the minutes will say are approved and we will now move into our first item and probably our biggest item for the day is the CARES Act project. And I'm assuming Ray, I'm turning this over to you or to Lara to give some background on how this came about and uh, all the things that are going on. Yeah, let me, let me go ahead and uh, give a little bit of background and and uh, share with you uh, what has happened with the CARES Act funding. Uh, it's it's one of those rare once in a lifetime type of opportunities I think that we've we've had given to us. Uh, I received a call from uh, the leadership from uh, the Education Appropriations Committee or Executive Appropriations Committee. Sorry. And they wanted to meet with me. Uh, this was prior to the, the most recent special session. And so I went and met with them and they, they said, you know, we have some funding that uh, 
that we want to uh, allocate to help uh, help education uh, in particular uh, be able to mitigate the uh, the uh, the coronavirus and the impact that it's had on our schools. And we want you to uh, put together a plan on how you would take uh, funding and what you would do with that funding. And they said, we, we want the plan to not be a K-12 plan. We don't want it to be a higher ed plan. We don't want it to be a, a telehealth plan. We, we want it to be a plan that meets the needs of all of your stakeholders that would, would have immediate impact, but would also have long lasting impact on uh, particularly education in the state of Utah. And so I, I said, okay, how much are we talking? And they said, uh, there is no limit on what we want you to, to envision. So we, uh, we worked with many of you, we worked with, uh, with uh, you know, representatives of all of our stakeholder groups. Uh, for K-12, we, we talked to, to school leaders, we, we talked to leaders of both charter schools and traditional schools. Uh, we, we spoke with members of the C Forum. We, we, we talked to USBE. Uh, we talked to uh, professional developers for many of the school districts, uh, the technology directors, uh, the USED organization uh, representatives, uh, and then members of this advisory council and UTN advisory council. Uh, we worked with higher ed. Uh, we met with the CIOs in particular, and they in turn went out to their colleges and and uh, looked at their immediate needs, and then also representation from the UTTC, which is is the higher ed version of C Forum, and got their input. And we put this plan in place. And I want to just uh, share with you. Um, what that plan looks like. But you, Rick, are you seeing my screen? Uh, not yet, but you have the, you are listed as the presenter. But it's not showing it. You just have to hit that arrow to share content down at the bottom. Okay. Just move your. Mouse at the bottom, you should see a little box with an arrow to share content. Yeah, it's a, I, I clicked on it. Hmm. Share content, and then my screen comes up. Okay, that's what I need to do. There right we go. There. Yep, right there. Okay, so now are you seeing the this? Yep. This is okay. So we uh, we looked at all things. You know, we we were open minded. We we thought, what are the greatest needs? For our stakeholders uh, that, that we have control over, and we had we had obviously the uh, the uh, timeline given to us that that anything that we did had to be uh, operational by the end of December, and so that's not uh, enough time to go out and and lay new fiber out in the far reaches of the state. You know those kinds of projects, but we were able to focus on some very specific things that we knew would have great impact and, and long lasting impact, uh, but would also be attainable by the end of December. The first thing is, and, and if you, you look at the yellow area right right there, you know, the first thing that we needed, we, we felt we need to make sure that we have is a good solid statewide network. And I and I think you all agree that that we are really uh, the envy of most of the nation on on our statewide network. We needed to make sure that uh, you can worry about what you do best, and that's educating students, and that we can focus on making sure that you have adequate bandwidth, that uh, that you don't have to worry about that, but you focus on on teaching students. And so that was that was the first area that we looked at was the network infrastructure, and we put together all of the the pricing and all of the projects that that would need to take place. We involved a lot of the a lot of the districts and charter schools, in particular, with with upgrades to the to the Wi-Fi capabilities of, of the schools, and and they they put together their needs, and uh, you know we were able to turn that around. Uh, Barry Barry Bryson's on the call here, uh, did a nice job in 
helping uh, work that through, uh, making sure that the regional service centers have adequate bandwidth, that, that the, the backbone uh, upgrades go from, from 10 to 40 gig up to 100 gig backbone, uh, those kinds of things so that we have good solid uh, network. The second thing then that we identified is we have to have the appropriate tools for our teachers to use. And so that, that would uh, be the software that we're, that we're talking about. And, and uh, you know, any, any district has, has the freedom to go out and purchase a software that you feel is important for your, your staff to use. We focus on those things that, that uh, have statewide application or, or, or demand across the entire state. So we're looking at things like, like WebEx, Zoom, uh, Google, Adobe, uh, in, uh, Canvas, expansion of Canvas, uh, Nearpod, those kinds of software tools that are of value uh, for our, our teachers to use. So that's, that's the second piece, the infrastructure, the software. Then when, once you have the software, you have to have the training for our, for our educators so that they know how to use the, the software appropriately and those tools that are at their disposal. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. I'll have Laura kind of share a little bit on that, uh, uh, on what we have there. There's, there's, a, there's a lot that uh, will be available for our, for our educators to tap into, the, to help them uh, make sure that they're, they're able to address uh, the needs of their students. We have uh, telehealth is is one of our areas of responsibility, and there are some things that that were needed uh, in the healthcare area to help with the coronavirus. Uh, telemedicine platform is is one of the most critical uh, that we're looking at, and then uh, again, getting those getting ready uh, for for opening of school again uh, in a technological sense. Uh, you know the the network uh, within within the buildings, the wireless, the hotspots, uh, the equipment uh, that that we need to make sure. Uh, I can I can I can envision that that most of our schools will be trying through because of social distancing needs, trying to expand out into areas of their facilities that they've never used before, and so they may be areas where where. Uh, uh, gaining access to the network uh, is is spotty, and so again, uh, beefing up the the wireless uh, capabilities and things like that uh, in our schools a great deal uh, to really to the tune of of, of nearly forty million dollars uh, has been uh, earmarked for that. And then there are some summer courses that are being facilitated uh, by the University of Utah uh, for all you know K twelve students, uh, no matter where they live throughout the state. Uh, different types of courses, uh, uh, computer programming, uh, ACT, well, prep, uh, that may be moot at this point, uh, ESL type courses, and then the paths uh, for those low income first generation college students, helping to, to prepare them as well. So those are, those are the things that, that we are, uh, that we have, have identified and let me pull up one more thing. And this is this is what Laura has been uh, focusing on, and that is the professional de development component. Laura, I'm just going to hand off here to you if you want to go ahead and explain briefly about that. And then after after Laura is gets through talking about professional development, uh, then I'd, I'd like Kelly Cole. Kelly is our project manager on this. She and Lisa Kuhn. I'd like Kelly to just kind of give you a, an overall update on where we are, uh, the progress that we're making uh, with that short deadline of, of December 31st. So, so uh, we'll, we'll hear from Laura and then, then we'll hand it back off to Kelly. Uh, Ray, what, what's the total amount then that uh, for, the, for the advisory council that we're talking about as you look at all these various projects? It's $125 million. And that, that's a significant and when, when we put, you know, when they said there's no limit on it, you know, we, we, we had a hard time uh, <laughs> spending, uh, you know, just unlimited amounts of money and identifying that we did get to uh, 200 million, uh, the 200 million mark. And, uh, and then that uh, 
we they ask us to scale it back down to 125 million. So that's that's where we're at with this. And I might just provide some context. I've been on some phone calls with some of my colleagues from other states and that. And um, to give you some perspective, a lot of these states, bigger states, much bigger states than Utah, were allocating 20, 30 million dollars uh, for technology infrastructure. Um, so I think it gives you some idea of the breadth and scope and commitment of these funds. I think so as Ray, I think you're absolutely right. This probably is a a once a one time thing. We'll, well I think it speaks highly of our legislators, to be honest. I I know they get a lot of flack, uh, you know, they don't do enough for education, but uh, I think their foresight to say, hey, you know, we need a plan that addresses all areas of, of education and telehealth here in our state and and the commitment that they made uh, to carve out that big of a chunk of, of the funding uh, I, is, is commendable. They, they uh, recognize uh, the value of, of addressing this in a statewide manner uh, as we have, but yet we've also uh, broken it down, uh, down to the local level to give you the ability to provide uh, feedback. And, and uh, Kelly can maybe talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening throughout the state, more at the local level. Okay. Thank you. Right, let's, Laura, do you want to talk about the professional development piece? Sure. Well, as you can see from Ray's screen, it's called Reimagine Teaching, since that's pretty much what's happening. And um, first of all, it's really nice that the appropriators, when they um, were making this plan with Ray and everybody, that they recognize the importance of professional development um, to assist faculty and teachers to prepare for things and, and adapt their instruction. So that's really good news. This is kind of a one stop shop collaboration with all of your institutions that are already offering professional development and then some others that we've been able to fund through the project. So when this website launches on August 10th, there will be a directory of workshops and webinars and courses that are available from your institutions or from groups that we've contracted with. So some other groups like ISTE, Leading Edge Learning, um, we're going to have all of that kind of in a one stop shop directory. So educators can find um, courses and opportunities that are available. They pre register on the site. So there will be a link to uh, say if they're planning to participate. And then um, the educators that complete at least four hours. We recognize that they're doing that on their own time and they're going above and beyond what's required. So for a minimum of four hours, if they go back on the site and document what they've um, accomplished, they have to show evidence like a certificate of completion and that kind of thing. Then we will reimburse them with a $200 Amazon gift card. So um, that program is for any courses that are June to December, June 1st to December 1st. And uh, it's limited to the first 25,000 educators. So we're hoping that you all as advisory council members can help get the word out about this opportunity. So the site will launch on Monday and there will also be a form to fill out if you wanna to contribute to your workshops or have any other questions or recommendations for us, there'll be an opportunity to show that there. The other thing I was just gonna mention is a lot of the workshops will also focus on Software that we license at a state as a state that kind of runs through um, through us. So things like um, Canvas, support for Canvas, uh, proctoring, captioning, Nearpod, Adobe, um, the ISTE workshops. Uh, we're partnering with the um, IC STEM organizations, and they'll be offering workshops. We're partnering with 15 arts organizations and three uh, mental well-being organizations that will be offering uh, workshops and opportunities. And finally, some support for public libraries. So any academic school or public librarians will be able to have uh, professional development geared directly toward them. And we've partnered with um, Marie, who's representing the public libraries and her colleagues at public libraries for that part of it. I had a quick question on that one. 
Um, so uh, I think you're addressing it a little bit, but uh, at the different institutions, we have our instances of Canvas set up in different ways. So we may have implemented different pieces of statewide consortium software. We may have said no to some of those pieces. Um, is there, will there be some information ahead of time on, for example, video conferencing best practices? I have a feeling that's going to be very different depending on the institution you're going to be at. Will there be a list of the products that they're going to be discussing and how to implement those into it before they attend the course? I, I, I just am a little worried that my faculty members will come back and say, hey, this is being used at USU. I want to implement this for fall and I, I don't have that feature turned on for a particular reason. Yeah, RC, RC, thanks for the question. So we'll be linking to the faculty support page that's at each of your institutions. And it's open on the website, so I can't prevent a faculty member from finding what somebody else is offering. Um, but we'll be helping to amplify the work that you're doing. And especially if some of the institutions are opening it up to K-12 teachers in their area or for other people across the state. So we'll just be linking to whatever you're putting on your website. Perfect, thank you. And I'll just add, because you had asked about software. So this is one of the instructional projects that my group is running. There are also some projects around statewide software. And um, I know that you have emailed me specifically asking about Canvas and some of those things. So those are separate projects in addition to this professional learning project. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on professional development? Okay, thank you, Laura. Uh, let me let me just mention that there was one area that I, I didn't uh, uh, mention, and that's this area of the plan, providing assistance for low income students. Uh, there's th this one piece is just for higher ed right here, but we found that about 5% of higher ed students do not have laptops or, or devices. And so uh, part of the funding is going to help purchase those. And then the higher ed institutions will be able to check those out to those students who don't have, have those devices. And then we have, we know we recognize there are many families that don't have internet connectivity in the home. And so we're we're working with the uh, USBE. We've we've uh, earmarked some of the funding, and USBE will be be managing that portion of the program. Uh, in in providing funding for families to to have internet connect connectivity right into the home. So let me uh, hand off now to Kelly. Uh, I can not share the screen anymore. Kelly, if you've got something or I can leave this. Yeah, just can share the screen and then I can just I'll just talk if you want to unscrew your sheet and share your screen. Stop sharing. OK, OK, you can hear me. OK, yes. Okay, well, thank you for handing the mic off. So um, I am over strategic initiatives for UETN. And right now, this is the major strategic initiative that's happening within our organization, like Ray said, and he gave a great um, introduction into how we got to where we are. Um, just a few high level comments from, from me, um, you know, the the cares act funding there there were basically three elements that that we needed to consider when we were deciding what things we would propose and what things we would fund um so we wanted them to be things that obviously respond to the COVID 19 pandemic um we need to be very careful that it wasn't things that were um, already part of base budgets um and making sure that these are additional services that are responding to the pandemic and then we also have a very um a very real challenge of having these projects finished by december and so being able to thoughtfully spend that that amount of money um in a quick amount of time has been has been a challenge, but also a great opportunity. And so um, Lisa Kuhn, who's also who's our CFO, um, she's been working very closely with me um, to, to kind of make sure that we have a really good internal process to make sure that we're audit ready, to make sure that we have, you know, invoices and receipts and everything ready to go. I think because because this um, this funding had very general criteria, we, we do anticipate that at some point it will be audited. And so we're being very um, careful and thoughtful about being able to um, think through our decisions and, and be able to, to respond well with what we've done with the money. 
Um, I think that in addition to the short term response that we're doing, um, if you look at the list, I, I, I'm very proud that we have things that are both responding to the pandemic, but also that I think will have long term impact for the state. And as as uh, Rick said earlier, you know, I think um, in other states, I think probably what you're going to see is that they'll probably have a lot of big contracts with a few vendors um, and spending their money that way. And we are approaching it on a very local level um, and trying to make sure that we we select projects that that really have a big bang for for our buck. Um, and just to give you kind of an idea of what my daily um, life is is like right now. So we're actually managing as of yesterday um, over 100 different projects. Um, and so, like Ray said, higher ed, K-12, um, we're also working with all the tech colleges um, in Utah and the projects. I mean, he gave a great overview, so I don't want to, I, I just want to talk about a few of them, um, but like the tech colleges are doing some really great things with um, a few of them are doing some virtual labs and clinicals, healthcare simulations, things that that they really could not do because of the pandemic. Um, we've been able to do a lot of work with the local districts. Um, as Ray mentioned, we're doing some home internet um, that will be starting a program with USBE um, very, very quickly. Um, and I don't want to take too much time on this, but but I think that the approach that we've taken has been something that not only is going to have a long term impact, but it's also touching like every corner of the state. It's hitting rural areas um, it, in, in multiple ways. And so you'll see that there are projects, there are multiple projects that will go into the rural parts of the state. Um, and also, I just wanted to comment, uh, Laura gave a really great overview of the professional development initiative that we're doing and you know that program started out as an idea of having kind of a day-long training for teachers and um and it has evolved into something very robust and pretty complicated actually and so we've been doing a lot of work with that program to try and figure out the best way to administer it so that so that it um so that it really does meet the needs of teachers. It's going to be a lot more custom than just bringing everybody into, you know, just having one day that's the same for everybody. The teachers will really be able to pick and choose what is going to help them. Um, and their technology, the gaps in their understanding of technology are so different. And so being able to offer a wide venue and then offer an incentive with that, it's become, um, like I said, a very, a very robust program from where it actually started and and it's we've spent a lot of time with Laura Trey and work through all the little um any anything that we can foresee that would be an issue with that program we've just been working with her very closely to figure that out but I'm excited that it's going to launch soon and that the teachers can start taking advantage of it um, but so far we've had amazing partners um and all of the groups that we're working with um, are doing very well, ordering their equipment quickly um, so that we can get a lot of these services out as soon as possible into the communities. Lisa, do you have anything you wanted to add? No, I, I'm sorry, it's mine. <laughs> I know Kelly did, did a nice job describing it. I'm good with it all. It, uh, it's it's been it's been a lot of fun though. I want everyone to know it's really been a lot of fun to see what everyone's done and how well. Yeah, it's very done. rewarding to work on. It's very very rewarding. So Rick, we'll uh, turn it back to you to to fill questions or whatever. We're we're here to answer. Um. A couple of questions that I maybe will start with. Um, one, because I get this question, and I it, it, well, one is the uh, the spreadsheet that you were using. Is that going to be posted or shared so that people can be able to talk to some of this with their constituent groups? Well, uh, yes, it's it's not a secret document. Uh, we're, we're willing to, to share that. Uh, Lisa? I, I, one caution I do have, though, is that it is um, sort of changing. So maybe we we might want to just do descriptions and not dollar figures just so that we um, 
because the budgets are changing when projects are coming in under budget. I, I don't know, Lisa, what do you think? I, I, I'm fine with that. Yeah. I just think it'd be good to have the major categories, the things that yeah. you're working on. If we, we could do something like that. I think, you know, for the, unless I'm wrong and the advisory council doesn't think that that would be a value, but uh, I think as you're talking to folks, I think that would be helpful. I think and really, be, yes. What's really good about, and we don't have that listed there too, but I think it'd be fun to see because we have every higher ed institution listed. I think that's what we're showing at that point. But we also have a list that's not showing of every public ed institution that's being supported too. And I think we have about 135 individual districts, charter schools that we're working with too. So it's a lot of people are touching. Well, I think that that would be very helpful to have. Um, hopefully the rest of the advisory council feels the same. Uh, definitely agree. Um, and we've been working with teachers all summer long and can we tell them that that Adobe's in place, Nearpod's in place, those Zoom, those kind of things are what's the what's your advice on sharing when or if when we can say that yeah. those tools will be available? Which was my second question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I can answer <laughs> that. That's a really good question. So there are some um issues that are still being worked out. And believe me, when we're able to announce that, Clint, you'll be the first to know. <laughs> we will send that message out to okay. our, the constituent email list. So if it's higher ed or public ed, you'll, we'll send the message out to okay. you. So okay. thank you for being sensitive to that. There's there's still some moving parts that we're, we're working through. And I was just going to mention, um, maybe rather than, I guess this is a question for all of you to give us advice. Um, if it would be more helpful to have a, a summary document, or we've talked about having a very high level website that could show uh, the projects and we could also put a Utah map and where they're located geographically and, uh, and maybe an icon if they're higher ed or public ed or telehealth or libraries, if that would be easier for you when you talk to your constituents or if you'd rather have a, a handout that's overview. Uh Personally, I'd, the website would be great. In fact, you know, Agreed. particularly with the map, um, I think oh, that does a lot for what we can do both uh, internally with people that we talk with, but I think it's also a great external type of tool that, you know, um, to really be able to show the depth and breadth of the impact. And well, and we will be uh, asked to uh, make periodic reports to the legislature. Uh, yeah. throughout the rest of the interim and, and into the uh, session. Well, the, the map idea really intrigues me because those that's something that legislators would really gra grasp, grasp as well in the sense that uh, they can go in and look at their districts um, or their areas and, and be able to see what's being done locally to them. Yeah. It's a good, great suggestion, Rick. Thank you. Um, I would like to open this up to the uh, to everyone. If you've got questions, um, uh, some, you know, you, or you want some clarification on some things, uh, this this is a really important uh, project. Rick, this is Shelley at Weber State. Yes, we have definitely benefited from this you know, from the CARES money at Weaver State, and we, we're seeing a lot of positives come from it. Our biggest, you know, the biggest scare is in four years or so when all yeah. these things we've implemented, being able to pay to either keep them or having to let them go. But those are going to be some big questions for us, and, and I think that's where our biggest concern is, but we're certainly excited about all of the things we've been able to implement. Uh, Ray, maybe, or, or, or Kelly, or Laura, uh, any of you, you know, obviously there's going to be, a, this is a one time, you know, this is one time money. Um, and there's going to be a lot of equipment that's going to be purchased. Has there been some talk with uh, legisl legislators or po other policymakers about that cliff that we've, you know, somewhat, you know, could be putting out there if, in a few years when things start to get age out? Yeah, there has been some of that conversation. Uh, one of the concerns they had was when we 
negotiate for software licensing uh, or or equipment with maintenance agreements. Our normal uh, practice is to negotiate for uh, long-term contracts, uh, usually five years. And they were really concerned about committing funding that far into the future. But, you know, because this is a one-time appropriation. And so that's something that we do have to be aware of that, uh, like Shelley said, we need to to re recognize that uh, in, in five years, you know, I don't know that we're going to be able to expect the legislature to come up with 125 million to renew everything that we've been doing. So that's that's something we need to be planning on and finding ways to uh, prepare for that that time when when uh, when the money is no longer there. Okay. Other questions, comments, um, clarifications that are needed. Well, thank you, Rick. It sounds like uh, they're they're comfortable with what they have now. What we will do is we'll take that document, you know, the plan. We're calling it the plan, and uh, we'll we'll put it in a format that we'll we'll send it out. As Kelly said, uh, some of the cost projections that that, that we estimated are, are they're coming back, and and we're seeing uh, perhaps uh, them coming in a little bit lower than what we anticipated. So we're taking those funds and we're redirecting it to those projects that were next highest on the priority list that we were unable to fund. And so we're, we're that's kind of the way we're working that through. So, uh, you know, it, I don't know that we necessarily need to show the, the cost amount, uh, but at least what the projects are, descriptions and what what the, what we're focusing on. Yes, and I think everybody looking at the chat, several have chimed in that the uh, website, the map would be a really good way to, to do that. That's something we can all get to uh, just by going to the UEN webpage, so. Um, yeah, and that's something maybe we could, Lisa and I could work on the general descriptions and then um, we could turn it over to Rich and his team to visualize right. that. Maybe. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, I just want to say, um, uh, you know, a couple of things. Uh, I think that, you know, when you look at the legislature came to UEN um, with this, I think this is a great um, if you if you wonder why you you know if the, you know being on the advisory council and and all of that you know what the value there is it's it, this is a great example of that um, because of the U E you know U, way U E N is structured in that um, they had a large pot of money that needed to be spent in a short amount of time and they had to find somebody who they knew could actually get that done and so I think this is really you know to Ray and to your team. Um, a great compliment uh, that they recognized all of the good things that uh, UEN has been doing, and then to be able to trust you to be able to get this done in such a short amount of time. I mean, you know, when you look at the network, uh, you know the you know the network infrastructure to the backbone, down to the wireless access points into schools, to home connectivity, to professional learning, to tools and resources uh, you know for teachers and faculty members to be able to, to utilize all of this being done when they only found out about it in June we are now at the first of August and everything has to be done this is in a I mean it's an amazing windfall first of all but it's also a great uh, testament to the great work that you have been doing thank you appreciate that. Okay, moving on to our next uh, our next item is the uh, broadcast schedule. Uh, I think this. I guess I'll be turning this over to you, Lara. I hope you had a chance to look at some of the uh, documents that uh, Lara was able to uh, that were shared on the you know, on the agenda and that prior to this. Hopefully, this will be a good discussion. I'm. Is it is it you, Laura, or is it someone else? Oh, there we go. Are 
are you on mute, Laura? We can't hear you. Yes. Yeah. I'm still not hearing her. Looks like she dropped off. Mm -hmm. Oh. There she is. Laura, you're on mute. Okay. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Um, so this is a block grid for fall semester and Kyle Anderson, who's our program manager, he's in this meeting um, and can answer questions about this. So this is just to um, give you an update of where we are and also as our advisors that represent our different constituent groups to give us some feedback if this is meeting the needs that you're hearing from the community. So the way that the program blocks work, it starts at midnight. And then you'll see the daytime starts um, with this block at 7 a.m. The color coding is the type of programming. So if it's a how-to program, a fitness program, a K-12 program, and so on. And so this is just to give you kind of the bird's eye view of what, we'll, what we're planning between now and at the end of the semester. Kyle's schedule's about two months ahead of time. So he's already in the fall <laughs> working on the schedule. Um, the prime time schedule that we uh, focus on has a different kind of uh, academic area each weeknight. And so he'll find documentaries or short series or things that are specific to those academic areas like science, world history, and so on. And then overnight, some of the programs repeat. So this is one of the three channels that we broadcast. This is the one that's specifically dedicated to education. And then I just wanted to mention this other um, approach. So this is a little bit different than what we have been doing for the, the school day schedule, knowing that a lot more of our students are at home and some that uh, may not have internet access or have spotty access or have a lot of siblings that are sharing the access may need to have more um, educational resources. So these are all over channel nine and um, we're trying to hit all of the curriculum areas midday uh, pre-k to grade two programs and then um, kind of a repeat of those curriculum areas in the afternoons in the uh, two to three block we're also doing a lot of how to which um, our how to programs also have an education bend to them so it might be a cooking or a painting or a crafting program um, that teaches that skill but also um, the education around it so that's just to give you an overview of where things are. And then the other document that's in the, your materials is um, each month we do a program highlights where there's a description of the programs that are coming up. And I just wanted to share that with you so you're aware of uh, what we do with that. We take that written information that Kyle prepares and then that's what we use for social media promotion, highlights on our website, um, messaging out to key constituent groups and so on. So this is a kind of open mic. If there's feedback about this or questions and Kyle and I can answer those. Oh, Lauren, this is Rick. I happened to take some time and just look through that uh, highlights for, I think for just September. It was a really, interesting programming that's coming up. Um, I'm hoping I'll take advantage of some of it in that, uh, uh, and, and, and that, but it was um, really quite interesting, uh, the, the depth and breadth. I think also, and then second, I wanted just to mention, as you look at that K-12, you know, sort of those, that learning block during the day and that, how, how important that was. I know then talking with some colleagues around the country that one of the questions that came up was how they could maybe use public access channels or, and that all I could say was, well, we already had all of these things going. In fact, I'm, it was right during the uh, first week or so of the school closure. Um, I think it was some an announcement that went out that was just talking about um, something that was going on, but a program that was going to be on that was that just happened to fit the curriculum right at that time. Um, we already had those resources and, and were able to start taking advantage of those, uh, which really helped our transition. So I think that uh, I really like what I'm seeing 
and uh, I really like a lot of this new programming. Um, others, questions, uh, comments? Kyle, I'm not sure if there's anything else you wanted to add. Uh, not really. Um, I'm just uh, happy to answer any questions on it. Um, this uh, daytime is the first change we've made in a few years, but I think it really responds to uh, current um, current events. We should, uh, we'll, we'll continue tweaking as we go along. I'm glad to see the joy of painting still there. <laughs> <laughs> That's when we get a lot of feedback on. We we need we need more Bob Ross these days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody. If you have other feedback or questions, just let us know anytime. Okay. And so, uh, with that, let's uh, now move into our uh, uh, discussion on the content policy draft um document and lara is this you that will be leading this it is give me just a second to pull that up okay. so um this is a document that's uh, a long time in the in, in the works um, and I first of all want to thank some of the folks on this committee that represent the library media community. So Leslie representing academic libraries and um, Colleen Eggett, who is one of our board members representing public libraries and Diana representing public media all provided some really specific input into um, this and those edits are reflected. So they were kind of the first um, review group. Um, this is open for your discussion, and then the plan is that it would go to the board in, in one of our upcoming meetings for their pr approval, and this would eventually be a UETN board policy along with all of our other policies. So um, we were, re were asked, and also our library media partners highly recommended that we have documented policy about how we make content decisions and how we handle issues that may arise with members of the public who have a concern or um, an issue with some of the content choices that we've made. And so there's a lot of guidance on this issue from the American Library Association and also from several public media organizations. So this language is lifted heavily from public media and public library uh, circles. So I'll just walk through the document quickly, and then if you have other um, feedback or questions, that would be really helpful. So there's an introduction, which I basically just explained to you. Why are we doing this? Um, part of it is digital content that's on our website. It could also be broadcast content. And so being really clear about why do we choose the, pro the content that we do um, is important. So uh, the first reason or criteria that, that Kyle and I use when selecting programs is the educational value. That's our entire mission. And so it it's, needs to have educational value. These are the other values that guide the content decisions. I'll pause with that on the screen for a minute. And then the last one is there's some practical considerations like the budget, things that come up, the current events, um, technical requirements, and so on. This is talking about how we maintain our collection of content and we regularly uh, weed through it and um, try to make sure that it's current. Um, then this is the procedure. If a member of the public um, has a concern about any of the content, we take that very seriously. So the procedure for when that happens is outlined in this next part of the policy. Um, the first thing is that we encourage them to just contact us directly and have a conversation. In my experience doing this, a lot of times that seems to resolve the issue. But if their concern isn't satisfied, then we have an online form that they would submit their um, the information about what their concern is. And then we can escalate that to our staff and to others. Um, another part that's, I think, key here at the bottom of the page, 
and this comes from the American Library Association and public media, is that if a member of the public has a concern, generally the question content remains available while the review process is going on. Um, obviously, if it's something that um, is, it has a technical error or is misspelled or something, we can fix it right away. But if it's a concern about the content itself, then we review that, we take that very seriously. Um, but the general practice is to leave that open and available. Um, within 30 days, we respond to the complainant's um, document that identifies those things. If they aren't happy with the response, then they have the chance to talk to the executive director for a reconsideration. That would be within an, an additional 30 days. And staff and the director may consult with um, any of our colleagues, you on this advisory board or um, our governing board or some of the representative um, professional groups that we're associated with, and those are listed there. Because we're a public broadcaster, there are really strict guidelines that, um, and Ray is the general manager and executive director for the broadcast. There are really strict guidelines that all programming decisions are made by our professional staff. And the reason that that's in the law about public broadcasting is that they wanna make sure that there's a firewall between um, people who are on board members and people who are on our boards and advisory councils and the decisions that are made about what goes over the public airwaves so that a board member couldn't, um, and this isn't really a true for us, but in other states, a board member may be um, representing maybe like a pharmaceutical company or something that has a lot of influence and there the decision about the content that's available on the airwaves and the, the identity of the board members has to have a firewall between it. So every year, Ray certifies that we make content decisions um, independently and we maintain editorial control over our um, delivery systems. This last part talks about how often we would review the policy. There's linked to some uh, to some other policies that are um, related. And then there's copies of the review request form. So this would be an online form. Um, this is very similar to what the public libraries across the country do. So um, anything that would help us to get some specific information about how the re how the resource um, was viewed, what the concern is, um, is it just a specific thing or is it in context with the whole resource, things that would help us when we do the, the consideration review. There's a sample letter here of how we would communicate and we would communicate to the complainant throughout this whole process. Um, but there's some sample language about that and that's it. So I'll open it up for if you have questions or any other feedback. Um, like I said, this will go to the board for their um, initial review in the next couple of weeks. So if you have feedback uh, for that or um, things that you'd like me to communicate to them, that would be really helpful. Just quick question. This is this is mostly for broadcast, correct? It's not because the the thing that comes to mind is the whole uh, thing that came up about our the EBSCO um, was EBSCO mm -hmm. on the research side, yeah, and the Utah's online library that kids were finding inappropriate content. Yeah, a good question, Clint. So um, we really view any of our delivery systems. This policy would apply to any of our delivery okay. systems. And a lot of times now, uh, even a broadcast program may be streamed or a video that we have in e media may be something that's also broadcast. So it's really any of our um, distribution systems would fall under this policy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good clarification. Thank you. How often have you had people question an item that's you know we know about ebsco obviously um right i'm in my 21st year and uh, at uetn and i can think of maybe a handful um okay. there were some that were very obviously needed to be changed right away so for example we had a lesson plan in our database that talked about um 
killing a goldfish for first graders. That was, I don't know how that got in our database and that was a very quick and easy decision. Um, and then there are some other examples that, um, you know, we would be careful with considering and getting information. Okay. Other questions, comments? Not that we take votes on anything, but you know, if you feel that this is ready for the board to to view, um, I would really appreciate you chiming in. This is Tiffany, and I think it's ready for the board. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah, I think so. I I, I would agree with Tiffany. Um, I really like your content selection areas of, you know, educational value, lifelong learning, dignity. I think those are all um, really good. I feel it. I feel like it, it, it's very inclusive. And I have yeah. to say that I didn't really think about programming decisions in a way that drives me to think about them being this inclusive. So um, I appreciate that. I would agree. Others. Well, then I think that that uh, wraps this part up. Laura, I think this looks good. And uh, I think from the committee, uh, from this council, we can say that uh, we'd support it going forward to the board, so. Thank you. And I'll mention that in our report that, uh, you know, that we did take some time to go through that and, re and, and review it. Um, which then brings us to, got to get back to my agenda here. Looking at multiple screens here, UEM PDTV. And I don't, is this uh, Laura, you or is this Katie? It's Katie. That one's me. Hi, everyone. Hi, Katie. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for letting me take some time to share this with you. So, um, hopefully, all of you are pretty familiar with UEM PDTV by now. Um, in the fall, like everything else, it's going to look different. We've shifted to um, remote production for all of our projects, and this will be one of them. So this fall, um, we're sad we won't get to be in the classrooms, but we'll be showing um, some of the unique and innovative strategies that teachers are using to teach um, in a new digital way. So to give you what we're working, a sneak peek of what we're working on right now, um, this is Holly Fisher, and she presented at our Reimagine Learning Conference that happened last week. And um, she shared her experience of switching to online, you know, very quickly last March. And what I really liked about her presentation is that she, um, and she'll share this in the PDTV, but um, she was able to add those fun classroom elements that students really rely on, like celebrating a birthday or field day, um, in an online format. So she used Flipgrid and all the kids recorded happy birthday messages for their classmates. Um, they, she had activities for them to go outside and use chalk to make their own field day. So I liked her examples of really bringing in that social support that classrooms provide for students in an online way. So she'll share those in this upcoming PDTV. Um, but what we're, what I'd love your advice on is, um, some topics that we can show and I'm sure you know of these great teachers and things that are happening in your districts and institutions. So some of the topics that we've been discussing are um, obviously these digital teaching strategies, support for social and emotional learning. Um, we need it. We've seen a need for um, giving good examples of meaningful feedback to students in an online environment. Um, and then ways of teaching these kind of more difficult topics that are usually a very hands-on like a shop or these CTE courses. So these are kind of the things that we have our feelers out for, but if you have specific recommendations um, or ideas, we definitely need them. Teachers are, everyone is super busy and overwhelmed. So um, we'll be respectful of time and everything, but we'd love to be able to show those off. Um, so, Here's our information. Even if you want to just tag us on something you see on social media, we can follow up on the idea or you can send me an email directly. But that's just a quick pre of what we're having, what we're planning on for this fall.
Hey, Katie, it's Laura. So if our advisory council members want to recommend somebody, do you know about what the time commitment would be for the faculty member or teacher to participate? Yeah, so it's about um, like a couple emails back and forth. We have a pre-production call just to kind of get these ideas ironed out and that's about a 30 minute call. And then we schedule about an hour for the actual interview. It's kind of fun where we sit down and get everyone's camera arranged and directing from a distance, but it's um, no travel time or anything like that. So we'd really like to make sure that we um, get to cover all the areas of the state because that's one of the things that producing uh, remotely allows us to do is to not have that travel barrier anymore. Now, are you using their equipment or are you, is this some of the CARES Act funding? I thought I saw some of this that you're going to be actually purchasing equipment or kits that will be able to be. Yeah, we do. We um, kind of, it, it, it'll depend. We do have some kits going out, but that's mainly to produce um, like the professional learning content. Um, we'll have, we'll be having so many of these interviews, we won't be able to send kits out to okay. every TV participant or interviewee. Okay. Katie? Mm -hmm. um, question about like the CTE content you're looking for. Yeah. So are you looking for something like remote projects, like hands-on projects kids could do in their garage with their parents? Tools that yeah. are remote? Because that takes in some funky liabilities some schools might not want to grasp. Thank, thanks for pointing that out. What we're trying to show is how they're able to shift to um doing these topics in a remote way so obviously we wouldn't want to suggest those kind of things but how they are accounting for those potential safety situations or something like that or how they're maybe doing more instructional video i'm not sure of how they're doing it i'd love to learn but um, yeah, they're, they're having some real big struggles especially with like um like woods and metals classes it's like um the tools are a nightmare to just try to figure out who has what yeah so like I said, that one might not be the perfect one, but like just showing about how how we're able to adapt and what things they haven't been able to do and where those limits are and being safe about it, I think okay. would be helpful for other teachers to see how they're doing it. Katie, we go back a slide and show those yeah. topics you're looking for. Yeah. And these are like the topics that we've brainstormed so far. So if you have other areas where we're seeing a gap, I'd like to know that too. So. Yeah. We'll keep an eye out. So that's really little. Yeah, Katie, this is Tiffany Hall, and I actually just came from a meeting where um, that was one of the things, the teaching of hands-on topics, and that's CTE, theater, dance, um, all of the fine arts, you know, ceramics, and, and, and all of those things are currently in that. How do I teach this hands-on class? And you know, what we're kind of looking, of course, Salt Lake, we're orange and we're remote, so high, we're the unicorn in the district, but maybe it'll change. But, um, you know, we're thinking about how can we prep kids online and then have them come in in small groups and do the hands-on pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the things that we're doing um, with that hands-on topic piece. So I'll keep you apprised. I've actually tasked Alex Rowe, who some of you may know, he's a digital learning person in my district, just to support CTE for the first six months of the year and see if we can get them able to do some of that hands-on stuff um, really well. The social and emotional learning piece, we just trained 300 teachers in Kagan instructional strategies over Zoom as a way of building um, teams and classes remotely. And so we'd be glad to connect you to some of our school teams that are doing that. Great, thank you. Going back to that CTE um, topic, I'd love to maybe even host a panel since it seems like something everyone's still trying to figure out where we just talk about it. And what are these questions? What are the concerns? Um, that might be helpful as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and another concern that I know from the spring with CTE was, you know, when all of a sudden you go live, there isn't a lot of material available for them. Like there, there is, if my English teachers could grab something out of Commons and make a go for a day of it while they kind of got their feet under them, but but the resources online for them to do those kinds of things are really limited. So if we had a panel, we could start figuring out maybe statewide who's building what online. That would be fabulous. Yeah, CTE teachers, we really have nothing. Like the the technology engineering, the skilled and technical, the business guys the, and girls are pretty good. Um, 
the engineering, the woods, the metals, it's really spotty. Okay. I'm, I'm glad that we've hit um, a topic that'll be relevant. And it, it's not an easy one to figure out, but I think that's kind of what we want to do is provide that platform to help. Mm -hmm. Stacy Firth is a great asset to tap into. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to think, I'll find some others and let you know if I can think of. This is Kim and, um, and the technical colleges are operating um, in kind of interesting capacities right now with competency based learning and um, I think that we have faculty who might be able to contribute to that conversation. That would be great. I will follow up with you because I think that's maybe something where we can, um, you know, bring down to K 12 of passing on what those tech, tech colleges are figuring out. That'd be a great partnership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Others. So this is Shelly at Weber State. Katie, I appreciate your presentation. I, one of the things that I think of that Weber is, does well is we're doing a lot of virtual stuff like for geo, the geoscience area, we're virtualizing 3D dimensional rocks like for view and that kind of stuff. And I feel like unfortunately in this time, all those virtual tours that we kind of did in order to pro, you know, promote VR and AR might not be as, as well utilized here because they'd still have to be filmed. But if they were already made, you know, some of the, the virtual headsets and all that, all the, all the data and material that they had helped with that, but knowing what you needed for a specific class and still having to film that would, would you know, would take time. But I do think there's probably some stuff like what we're doing that could benefit some of those schools. I just don't know. It would be nice to kind of know what the curriculum is to be able to pinpoint what it is we could make available or, or what would work for them. Okay. Not, not very well said, but that's all the kind of my jumbled thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I look at our previous um, episodes about VR and I see the kids sharing headsets and I'm like, no, I can't. <laughs> the whole new world. <laughs> but it's the content on those headsets. I mean, yeah. like if there's a way you could project the content and it already being captured, it would work. Just not through the headset, right? Yeah. yeah. Any others? Well, what I like, Katie, is that you've hit uh, K twelve public uh, K twelve the tech colleges and higher ed. And I think that that's important that we have, this could be a resource for everyone. So, uh, and that. If there's no other comments or suggestions for Katie, then we'll move into our last uh, agenda item, which is our round table um, meeting, which is just an opportunity for you to provide any comments, uh, updates, recommendations. Uh, this is a, this is your time to uh, have with the, UN leadership here that we have here um, with anything that you would like to bring up. So I'll open it up to all of you. Just personally, again, thanks for all the, the work you guys have done. Uh, it's Clint here on the, uh, the CARES funding and all the different pieces and everything. Um, and I know it's maybe hard to, to speak to this, but is there any any ideas on on timetables or anything for when all the all the remote production stuff and all those like basically selfishly for me when 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 are we going to get to do all the work uh, with with all the you know figure out the different lessons and the different kind of things we're going to be producing for you guys. Yeah, Clint, it's Laura. Good question. So the projects that you asked about, um, you'll know more a week from today. So within okay. the coming week. We've, uh, we've just ordered the equipment for the remote production kits. And um, just so you all know, each of the regional service centers will have a remote production kit that they can use for producing tutorials and, and other instructional materials. So we'll, we've just ordered them and you should be getting them hopefully within the week. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Laura. I just like to thank QEN. I just, 
ask Katie if it was her class and she won't take credit for it, but that blended learning class that went out, I think the 200 people in the soft opening were all from my district. It's exceptional. Thank you for that. So it, it just, you know, I, I've been looking for something all summer that would fill that gap. And it is so well done. So thank you for supporting teachers with that course. Is that the reimagined learning course? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I reviewed the content for that. Um, they put together a Canvas course for, for educators um, on basically, I think there's seven areas, if I, if I remember right. Um, I, I'm still working through the second, so I don't know how long <laughs> oh, I haven't got that. I just looked at the overview. You're better than I am. You're, you're better than I am, Tiffany. I just looked at the overview <laughs> and as far as I get, you know, mile but wide, it, mile wide and an inch deep. It is, it is really helping our teachers begin to wrap their minds around, okay, it, it, this, there really is some change in instruction and we can do it. I mean, the, the examples are clear. Everything's, it's just beautiful. I don't know how you pulled that off that fast, but kudos. Yeah, uh, I thought it was spot on as well. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, thank you, Tom, for your comment in the chat. If you if you have the chat open, uh, you can see Tom uh, Cheatham's uh, comment. Just to you know, and uh, you know how it, they've been. I think it's one of the testaments of this of this CARES Act funding is is that they it's, it's not it, it it's impacting all of the constituents of of, of UEM and. That's hard to do, so. So thank you. Others, questions, comments. I'm not other, but I have one more. I also just want to say, Laura, Charisse, um, Carol, and the whole IVC group have really. I'm just so thankful they haven't killed us all in our sleep. Um, they have been <laughs> very patient with all of the. The territory that comes with going in and setting up those classrooms in multiple schools and and the installers, everything has just been amazing. Like even our people are like, oh, okay, well, I guess the UEM installers can come into our classrooms. Like it, it's really been a great process. So thank you for that too. Now I'll be quiet. No, I, you keep you keep right on going, Tiffany. <laughs> no, thank you. That's good to know. Any others? Um, I want to know where RC is camping. He's probably in his kitchen. <laughs> You're on mute. We can't hear you, RC. I'm laughing at myself. That's funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> of course, this is totally fake, uh, but the, I imagine I'm in the Uintas right now. So. That's, that's that's my place of of calm. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Any others? Ray, any final comments that you would like to make? Yes, uh, I just want all of you to know how much we appreciate you. Your input is extremely valuable. I know that you've been involved in in helping generate ideas and suggestions and direction for us. So, so thank you for the time that you you give to us to help make us a a better organization. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are without you. So thank you. Thank you, Ray, and I thank you and Laura and all the other. Uh, team up at UEN for for listening, uh, first of all, and for, for providing this opportunity. Um, I think it's a testament to the strength of the organization that you do reach out and do value uh, the input from your constituent groups that you work with and, and that. And so thank you. Um, and thank you to all of you who are um, members of the advisory council. Um, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules, particularly right during this uh, time of trying to set schools up uh, for for start that will be happening in the you know I think some will be starting as early as next week, and then uh, moving you know adding on each and every week thereafter. Um, 
thank you for your time and being able to be here to provide input. Um, you've given some substantive input today that will help us as we move as we move forward uh, in these coming weeks and months. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a successful uh, opening and that we will be able to uh, remain open. I think that's probably one of the big question marks out there, you know, is, uh, but uh, no matter what happens, um, we are better, pre we were, we thought we were doing pretty good in March, but I think even now we're even better prepared and got more in place. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really, you know, testament to all the work that you've been doing is to, you know, no matter what happens, um, we'll be in a better position than we, than ever before. Um, our next meeting, um, I believe, will be um, is going to be. I guess I better look at it just to be sure. October ninth, um, and I need to uh, quickly look at that. Just to, I can't remember if that is is that on a Friday or is that one of the ones that we moved to a that is on a Friday um, October 9th is when we're scheduled for our next meeting so if you'd have that on your calendars if there's any changes to that we'll give you much advance notice on that okay all, all right. right thank you all um, You've earned your extra 35, 36 minutes uh, back to your life. I'm sure you'll be able to fill it up with something else. So thanks all. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks for you. Okay. There we go.